Patrick, we are here at the Sweden Distillery in Holland, which is your family's distillery, right? Yes. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, the history of this? Of course. My father started the distillery in 1974. He bought a, bought a plot of land on the other side of the uh, distillery. And he started his own distillery after being a master distiller for one of the big distilleries in Holland for 25 years. And then in 1975, he started production slowly. Um, so my brother and me grew up in the distillery. And every time we built and extended the distillery as we had a little bit of money. Um, until now, we have about uh, 5,000 square meters of distillery here uh, with an off-site warehouse um, as well and another off-site warehouse being built, uh, hopefully this year. So what's the capacity of the distillery regarding whiskey? Um, well, capacity or production. At this moment, we do about five tons of grain per day. Okay. So that is... Which is quite a lot. One it? shift. Yeah. Okay. And now you show us around here? And of course. Let's this is the office building, of mm -hmm. course. And then we can walk towards the distillery, which of course is my favorite <laughs> place. Everybody's favorite place, probably. So these are the old stills that we... I, you know, grew up using direct fire. Mm. <laughs> See, my colleagues are preparing some casks for filling. Oh yeah, this is my, this is our, our wash still. Um, this is now in operation for the last four four years, I think. It's 2019. Yeah. Um, this is about a uh, wash of 17,000 liter. So we fill it in the morning with 17,000 liters of beer or wash, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, it's still all day until about you know, um, six o'clock at night. Then it's cleaned and uh, filled for the next day. It's made where? This is uh, four sides. Four sides, okay. And then we have here the spirit safe. This is the spirit safe, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then is our spirit still, which we fill with 10,000 liters every day. We have falling line arms. Yes. So actually, you're running one shift a day right now. We're doing one shift a day, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you see that they're quite tall. Yeah. You fire them with gas or with steam? They're steam heated, yes. Steam. And then one thing that is peculiar is that we built the spirit still to the exact same height as the wash still. And why did you do this? Because it was prettier. <laughs> or shall I now tell you a story about no. how it influences the flavor? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was, um, yeah, that, that looked nicer if it had the same mm -hmm. height. But yeah, I do like quite tall stilts. Yeah. So a copper condenser on it. And then you see... I'm a bit of a control freak. So what you see, if you look down here... Yeah. You see that in the spirit line, where the alcohol comes out of the yeah. condenser, goes through the spirit line into the spirit safe. See that in the spirit line, there's a temperature gauge that measures the temperature. But also we have a mass flow meter there that measures the flow rate uh, and also measures the density mm -hmm. of the liquid. So you ex know exactly where you are uh, within the process. Perfect. I like to have a little bit of a full control over the distillation process. So how do you determine your cut points? Experience is a big thing in these things. Huh? So you know with cut points is that the four shots, are, we take about 200, 250 liters. Um, that's done by the computer actually. You know, it measures 250 liters, it measures density. And when it reaches the points that I want 
it cuts to the middle cut. Mm -hmm. And then we go to the uh, mi middle cut and we distill into the, the after runs, with the feints, whatever you want to call it. And what you see there is that that cut is pretty much important. You know, the four shot cut is important for the fruity flavors, the esters. The other cut point, the second cut point, is important for um, the character of the whiskey. Yeah, so, how longer you you cut, how, how later you cut, mm -hmm. how later you cut, how bigger your new make is going to be, how richer your new make is going to be. So, there's no good and bad cuts in our business. You can do whatever you want and still make a good whiskey. As long as you respect the whiskey that you make. So if you do make a really big whiskey, you have to keep in mind that you have to leave it in the barrel for 20 years before it's anywhere near finished. Mm -hmm. If you take a really narrow cut, you have to keep in mind that it will always be a little bit maybe simpler whiskey and not that richness that you mm. maybe want. So you have to, every distiller has to find their own cut points where he or she feels comfortable with. And, and, and that fits his stills, his, but also, you know, we all talk about still shapes and the angle of the lie arm and all these things, all important, but the flow rate is even more important than all these things. So. You have to find cut points that work for you as a distiller. Mm -hmm. and what kind of whiskey do you want to make? And also work with your equipment and, and how you are using it. So are you distilling fast? Are you distilling slow? All these things influence how your whiskey is going to taste mm -hmm. when it's done. So to sum it up, you have to add a little bit of imperfection to make a perfect whiskey. I'm, I'm a big believer that you have to have some imperfection in your new make in order to make uh, uh, an interesting whiskey. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's your little imperfections that create attractive whiskies. If it's too clean and too neat, I think you, you, ha you run the danger that after three or four years is perfectly flawless. But a little bit of imperfection makes your whiskey more interesting, I think. So one thing we do, most of our production process is of course very similar to what my Scottish friends are doing. Mm -hmm. So we have a mash tun, uh, we mill the grain in a roller mill, it goes in the mash tun at 65 degrees centigrade. Um, and then we do a drain the wort. One thing we do different from my friends in Scotland that we recirculate the wort over the grain bed until it's clear. Yeah, so it's more like Japanese production than typical Scottish production. And when it's crystal clear, we uh, pump the wort into the fermentation tanks there. You see they're all stainless steel, but maybe what you cannot see is that they're all temperature controlled. So on the outside, there is a, a coil that is cooling down the fermentation as it progresses. Now, as you know that uh, as soon as you add the yeast, the yeast starts multiplying and, and once it starts growing and eating and feeding on the sugars, it also produces warmth, heat. And this heat will make your warts, your sugar water, rise in temperature um, and then at some point um, you'll reach a point where uh, the heat will, uh, will quickly make the yeast work even faster. And you can be done with your fermentation in two days. Yeah, so 20 years ago in Scotland, average fermentation time was 72 hours. Right now you see a lot of distilleries shortening that fermentation time. It makes perfect sense from an economical perspective because you can make more whiskey with the same equipment. Um, we do the opposite. So we went from five-day fermentations 
do seven day fermentation. So we do long, slow fermentations. And these long, slow fermentations are, you know, on purpose because, you know, mm. it takes a lot more equipment mm. to do these kind of seven day fermentations. Um, but we believe that these longer fermentations give more uh, possibilities for uh, growth of lactic acid bacteria in your beer, yeah. in your wash. Which choice of use, uh, yeast do you use? We use different yeast strains for different products. So we use seven different yeast strains in the mm -hmm. distillery. And we try to uh, combine different yeast strains for different results. And so we use, for example, an M strain distiller yeast with our uh, malt whiskey, mm -hmm. but we combine it with a Belgium brewer's yeast, a, a Trappist yeast, it's a, an old fashioned brewer's yeast, mm -hmm. um, mostly used for dark beers in, in, in Belgium. And whereas the brewer's yeast is very uh, good at making fruity flavors, the M strain, the distiller's yeast is very good in uh, making alcohol. So we combine the two to have a little bit of the best of both worlds. Okay. And what, in your opinion, how, how big is the influence of yeast for the flavor of the whiskey? Yeast is huge influence on the end product. If you take different yeast strains and mm. you ferment the same wash with different yeast strains, you get completely different results, both in yield as in flavor profile. Mm. So M strain is a is a perfect yeast for whiskey production. This is why everybody in Scotland uses it. Um, it produces a nice congener profile, and it produces, you know, it has the capability to produce 410 to 420 milliliters of alcohol per kilogram of grain, which is, you know, almost 100% efficiency, which is immense if you compare it to my Belgian brewer cheese. Um, you know, if I just ferment the same wash with brewer's yeast, I maybe reach 355, 360 milliliters of alcohol per kilogram of grain, so way less efficient. But then again, interesting flavor profile. So by combining the two, you try to have somewhere in the middle. There's also where we end up with the yield. We end up somewhere in the middle uh, between the two. So we don't get the 400 uh, milliliters of alcohol, but you know, more than the 360. Now these are completely different stills, at least from the looks of them. And you just told me they're used for whiskey making as well. These are used for whiskey making as well, though they're mostly used for Geneva mm -hmm. production. Um, but we also produce rye whiskies um, on the same stills. These are used for the wash distillation, so the, for the first distillation they're used. Mm -hmm. As you can see, they have different condensers and they have an external uh, heating. So they have a, a steam bath where the, the copper still but They sits come inside. from Germany. They are from Germany, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're from uh, Arnold Holstein. They make perfect stills, um, very good quality, different. The result is not that different as you would expect. You know, most people that look at that still yeah and look at that still and say, oh, your whiskey must have changed a lot since you changed stills. But to be honest, the whiskey didn't change as much as you would expect. Mm -hmm. You know, the differences are quite small. Um, and to be honest, in any whiskey distillery, maybe people won't tell you this, but there's always little differences between batches. You know, these, um, yeah. that, that is natural in a you know, whiskey distillery. You said uh, the rye whiskey is also made here. Yes. Uh, what's the difference in making rye whiskey and making malt whiskey? Well, the, the biggest difference is, of course, that in a malt whiskey, you use a, a lotter ton to filter the grain out of the sugary water, the warts. Mm -hmm. and so you create warts and you create, you, you uh, create spent grain, so uh, dry husks of grain. Um, when you make rye whiskey, rye doesn't have husks, so there's no way to filter out the grain particles out of the sugar water. So 
though the meshing is very similar, you cannot separate the two. So you, what, you have what we call an under-grain fermentation. So you leave the, the grain particles in the mesh, right. which is fine if you do it later. You, you distill it in a, a column still. That would be no problem, as they do in America with bourbon, for example. But on the grain fermentations are notoriously difficult to do in a pot still because of you run the risk that these grain particles that are still in the mesh create, uh, they burn onto the heating surface. Right. So that is the, the downside of doing on the grain fermentations is that you have more challenges in your production. At first, in the fermentation, because if you mix rye with water, uh, every day we create about 15,000 liters of wallpaper paste. You know, it's, it's thick, it's gloopy, it's like slimy consistency. Yeah. Um, so right there is one of the reasons why we do temperature controlled fermentation, because when the first thing, you know, the first reason is that you can drag out the fermentation and make it longer and slower. But the second reason also to, to make the rye whiskey, for example, ferment less vividly uh, and therefore control the foam uh, creation during fermentation. What's your mash bill for the rye? Is it 100% rye? Sorry? What's your mash bill for the rye? Is it 100% rye? We do 100% uh, rye, rye whiskey. But the 100% rye is divided in about 50% malted rye and 50% unmalted rye. Right. If you look inside the still, This is the spirit still. You can see a standard, well, a modern standard heating in there. It's a yeah. steam uh, heated still. But this is a modern, they used to have these coils, that was leaked, remember? Mm -hmm. Old stills have these coils now. Yeah. This is the modern equivalent of those coils. Yeah. You can imagine that if you do anything, put anything in that still with solids inside, you run the risk that the solids burn yeah. on the on the heating. And because we also do rye whiskey and Geneva with on the grain fermentations, if you look inside this still, well, yeah. it needs to be cleaned, but you get the idea. If you look inside this still, you see that there's no heating inside the yeah. still. It's actually like in Sdarni. They also have external heating. Let's see. Because the heating is here. So there's a, we, we drain 120,000 liters of beer yeah. an hour, run it through the heat exchanger and pump it back into the still so yeah. you heat it's an external heating loop and because of the high flow rate you make sure that the solids don't burn so we have six stills in this room uh, these ones are used for um, uh, flavor distillations so we Distill lemons for the lemon liqueur, the oranges for the orange liqueur. Um, the, what you just tasted uh, is the Geneva. Um, it's redistilled partially uh, with botanicals, so juniper, licorice root, and aniseed. And that's done in depth, those stills. Mm -hmm. Those stills are for flavor distillation. If you distill a lot of whiskey, you also need a lot of tank storage to store it all. Yes. And of course, you also need tank storage to store the whiskey that you take out of the casks and put 
you know, are going to put in bottles. So you need both sides of the production process, you need storage. So how much storage do you have here in the tanks? Uh, these are, most of them are 15,000 liters. Right. So I don't know how many we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 10, 20, yeah, 20, 30, 30, 30 tanks, I think. So this is one of your warehouses. This is the smallest. Yeah, this is, uh, this contains about uh, three and a half thousand casks. So this is our smallest warehouse. You have only palletizing warehouses? Um, since last year. Last year, everything was on racks. <laughs> since last year, I had to change because I was running out of space. So yeah. I had to. Yeah. This is easier. Mm -hmm. This is better. Oh, it has advantages. Um, I think the cask manipulation like this is, is very easy and quick. Okay. So you can quickly take them out, move them somewhere else, uh, empty them, fill them, put them back. That, yeah. that works fine. <coughs> But it was a lot of, when they're empty, yeah. they're easy to put on pallets. Yeah. But we, we put, last year, we put 9,000 full casks on pallets. That was kind of a big job. Yeah. How long did it take you? Sorry? How long did it take you? A whole year. <laughs> <laughs> we had three people working on it. Not, maybe not every day, but yeah, we had three people working on it almost a whole year. So Since where do your casks come from, the bourbon casks? Well, this, this is all... This is not bourbon cask, okay. so I buy virgin oak, you so buy I buy them new. Okay. And then, uh, because if I buy them new, I can specify how they are made. So I like the galvanized hoop, for example. Um, so if I buy them new, I can specify how the cask is made, uh, what kind of use, wood is used, um, how long is toasted and how long is charred. So that I think that is a big difference between buying Cast that are from wherever and then. But do you reuse them now? Yes, of course. Yeah. No, I think the we rarely use them. Virgin oak is almost never used for malt whiskey. On a, you know, experiments, <laughs> uh, notwithstanding. But yeah, on the whole, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, we don't use virgin oak for malt whiskey. But we use it for rye whiskey, for example. Right. And after they've been used for rye whiskey, you can perfectly use them for malt whiskey. These are still empty. Came in last week, you know, waiting to be filled. And those came on on Friday. I don't know. Thursday was King's Day here in Holland, so Friday. Friday, almost nobody was working, so I had a very small stuff to unload 190 casks with. Who makes them for you? Um, normally, I buy my American oak casks from Kelvin Cooperage, mm -hmm. but there's a kind of an issue with virgin oak casks in the US at the moment. So I now had the American oak casks made in fr f uh, France, Spain, and Portugal. I bought them from this year. So everywhere <laughs> I get, get casks from, I buy them. The question for me is now, if you uh, all store them palletized, um, you have to have some kind of leakage, a small percentage, how, how, how much is that? I think, I don't think palletized leads to more leakages necessarily. But you can't control the, the casks that are in the back when they're leaking. Kind of. But you, neither can you, <laughs> if they're all wrecked and they leak out way in the back, you mm. cannot you know, control that either. You always have some leakages, you know. We have 15,000 casks in stock. That means, you know, somewhere a cask will always be, you know, leaking in. But it's nothing that concerns you from, from the I, amount of leakage. Nobody likes yeah. leaking casks, you know. No distiller likes leaking casks, but, you know, a little bit of um, loss is, is unavoidable, you know, especially mm -hmm. with the old sherry casks. You have some issues with uh, their being more delicate than than new casks or quite new casks, so yeah, you have some more issues with them. Well, what's the angel share in, in, in Holland? On, in my other warehouses, my angel share is between 5 and 7%. Oh. But some idiot built this warehouse adjacent to the distillery. I don't know who did that. <laughs> but 
it was me. Um, and that wall is not insulated. Okay. So now it's still quite cool here, but you know we had last year we had twelve percent angel share here. Wow. Yeah, that's huge. That's about the same. It's very dry here. In this India, is, for example. Yeah, this is a very dry warehouse, mm -hmm. and it's and it's quite on average, it's quite warm during the year. So um, this is the most unfortunate warehouse that I have. But anyway, it does give you nice whiskey because yeah, it, um, right. in my new warehouse I can control the humidity. So having different warehouses with different climatic uh, circumstances gives you also the opportunity to play with the different flavor profiles that these warehouses mm -hmm. give because a warm dry warehouse like this one provides a different flavor profile than a humid warehouse like I have on the other uh, offsite um, so that that you can play around more with those different flavors so we have about um, about 55 percent of my casks are sherry casks uh, and and almost all of them are these old Bodega, Solera, whatever you want to call it, production casks. Um, and then we have some 40% uh, American oak, which we buy as virgin American oak and then we reuse them. And then we have some, of course, all kinds of different casks, port, Madeira, you know, all those casks are in there as well, but not in huge quantities. Mm -hmm. So what is the oldest cask from your stock? Uh, my oldest cask is a Geneva cask from 1990. And my oldest whiskey casks are from 96, but I sold a lot of them last year. So I have not many left. So you get them directly from bodegas in Spain or in yes. Portugal? Yes. And then we, we fill them and of course we refill them. Personally, I often think that the second filling the second filling is often more balanced than the first filling, to be honest. Is there something like a sweet spot for your whiskey when you say that's the correct age for what you're doing? Or I love old whiskey, so yeah. I'm a big fan of old whiskey. You know, as a distiller, I would want to say that young whiskey is the best whiskey there is, <laughs> um, and it doesn't need to age at all. But yeah, I think old whiskey is. Um, has something a special quality to it. That's because of the, all the layers of flavor that you get in old whiskey that you do not get in uh, in younger whiskey, or mm -hmm. it's more hard to achieve as a distiller in young whiskey. So, but a perfect, no, because I think as with most things in life and whiskey as well, you see that there's a there's a place where you would probably prefer to drink some younger whiskey and sometimes you crave some older whiskey and, and both have their merits um, most of my whiskey is not perfectly suited for drinking at three years of age but then again i think peated whiskey on the whole so peated whiskey as a category is is more suitable mm -hmm. for bottling at a young age than unpeated whiskey because of the natural layers of flavor that you already get inside the whiskey and also because you're stretching out the distillation a little bit longer you get extra layers of flavor mm. is there something like a house style for sweden i think so yeah i think there is something that we do differently from other people that creates the special flavor we you often get a lot of orange notes in our products and have no clue where it comes from but it's something we do wrong in all our products and it, it, it seems to develop naturally in the casks it's not in the new make so it, it comes from the interaction of the new make in the mm -hmm. casks now we all know that you know you and me everybody that knows something about whiskey know that we often simplify these aging process so it's not just a matter of extracting flavors from the wood and some oxidation and then everything will be all right it's a whole complex interaction between the wood and the flavors that you extract from the wood, the oxidation from the new make whiskey, and then 
the interaction between all these things over the years, all these different compounds keep interacting with each other and creating all these layers and layers and layers and layers of flavors that make the whiskey so interesting.